Okay, hello everyone. Thanks so much for coming. So uh, to start with, the UNC, Gre the UNC Greensboro community has historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Kiawe and Syrah. In providing this acknowledgement, we also hope to bring awareness to the vibrant Indigenous communities whose members still call Greensboro home and are represented in the Guilford Native American Association and who are recognized by the state of North Carolina. These are the Koheri, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, the Halua Saponi, the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, the Meharan, the Saponi, the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, and the Wakama Suan. We honor and respect the many Indigenous peoples connected to the land where we gather today. We advocate for a university level initiative in consultation with Indigenous students, faculty, staff, and communities to make space for Indigenous people by investigating ignorance and bias within the faculty, staff, and student bodies, recruiting and retaining Indigenous faculty and staff across all departments, creating safety nets for retaining Indigenous students, and developing coursework around language decolonization and land and water protection, which are culturally relevant and innovative in addressing issues of indigenous sovereignty and environmental sustainability. If you would like to be involved in this initiative, please contact evs at uncg.edu. Uh, with that, I'm happy to introduce our two speakers today. So first of all, Gregory Carlton is a doctoral candidate in geography at UNCG. His research interests include sustainable transportation, spatial analysis, GIS, and data science. He currently works on charging station accessibility work across multiple geographies, but with a special focus on North Carolina. And our other speaker, Dr. Salima Sultana, is a professor in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Sustainability at UNCG and recipient of the 2021 Edward L. Ullman Award from the American Association of Geographers Transportation Geography Specialty Group for her significant contribution to the field of transport geography. She is also a recipient of the 2019 CDAG Research Honors Award for her publications and research leadership in the field of geography. In addition to authoring a book on transportation modes across the world, she has published numerous journal articles, book chapters, and research reports, reviews, and blog posts. Her publications appear in a wide variety of outlets, including some of the highly respected journals in her field of specialization, including the Annals of the American Association of Geographers, Computers, Environment, and Urban Systems, Urban Studies, Urban Geography, Journal of Transport Geography, Transport Policy, and Southeastern Geographer. She served as a board member and chair of the AAG Transportation Geography Specialty Group, co-chair for Cluster 6 of the Network of European Transport and Academic Research, guest editor of special issues of the Journal of Transport Geography and Sustainability, and is currently serving as an editorial board member of Journal of Transport Geography. She is a co-editor of Southeastern Geographer and serving as an AAG counselor representing the Southeastern region. Her co-authored book entitled The Geography of the National Park System will be published in 2022 by the University of Georgia Press. So with that, please join me in welcoming our speakers for their talk, Electrification and Transportation, an Equitable and Just Transition. Um, thank you, Sarah, for, um, thank you, Sarah and Sean for giving such a wonderful welcome and invitation to give us this talk. It's a very new topic and uh, we are actually investi investigating. Uh, Greg Carlton is very uh, integrated part of this conversation. Uh, uh, so I actually um, am very happy to have him, have him with me to give this talk. As from the title, you see that um, electrification in transportation I would say that you know we are actually searching for an equitable and uh, just transition. Um, but starting this conversation, let's uh, admit that we all need energy. Electricity is a secondary source of energy. And it often depends on the primary sources of energy, such as fossil fuels. And now you understand how if you have a little bit of sustainability background, you will clearly understand that why we are, everybody is talking about electrification in transportation. Globally, 
we are dependent on the fossil fuel energy. Without energy, um, we really cannot do anything. Uh, we can. We all have to admit it. Even today's talk is not possible without energy. Globally, we do use. We are very much dependent on fossil fuel. I wouldn't go beyond. This is you know, energy sector can be one of the talk. Uh, but I will stay on the focus that using this fossil fuel basically create carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide mostly comes from the other sector also create carbon dioxide, but mostly 65% actually come from the fossil fuel. And this demand for this fossil fuel is increasing gas, oil, coal, these are all fossil fuel. Since demand for the oil, fossil fuel is increasing, the carbon dioxide is concentration is also increasing as you see in this graph. And there is a strong scientific evidence that built up greenhouse gas emission is the primary cause of global warming. And that is especially, this is excelling in a very high rate. That is very concerning uh, to the global community. Where is it coming transportation? This is even more concerning that transportation use fossil fuels heavily. 92% of energy, transportation related energy comes from fossil fuel. If you look at here, that all other economic sector where comparatively making some transition to other sources of energy, but, elect, but transportation is entirely dependent, still stuck on the fossil fuel. If you look at in the United States, that's statistics even more concerning that 60 globally, that the 35% among all those energy we use, 35% actually we are dependent on the petroleum energy in the United States. Among them actually, 68% of those petroleum energies used for the transportation. And transportation used 35% of those, 24% of those energy. And those energy, basically 90%, all those energy that transportation sector used, 90% actually is dependent on petroleum energy. And this scenario is, is, is going on for a long time. And that's why it is very concerning. Especially it is concerning because transportation is impacting heavily carbon dioxide emission from the transportation is heavily impacting on the climate change. In the United, it's almost 30 percent of the carbon dioxide comes from the transportation sector. Globally, this is 14%. And as I said, that transportation is 92% of energy comes from the fossil fuel. And that's very concerning. And it's mostly this greenhouse ga gas comes from our everyday life, how we are traveling, how we, our food are transported in, in, the, in the United States is 82% of this transportation related that providing our everyday needs. Globally, that is 63%. Many people believe uh, as we do that many, many that is that well is a transportation is just a local component. Transportation has a two types of component. One is basically local, in other words, is global. 
Some of this stuff is local, for example, the noise and air pollution. And unfortunately, disproportionately, those burden is generally goes to the under or underserved community, low income um, community. Long lasting effect also goes to global level. It doesn't stay only in the local level. It also goes to go global level and it actually create the uh, climate change. Well, the major concern that many people didn't care, but major concern basically came that climate change is also impacting the transportation. The tra transportation impacted on climate change, but climate change that everything happening because of the climate change that is also impacting on the transportation. Heavy damage on infrastructure when there is a flood, tree falls, crack on the street, it has a tremendous expense. Not only that, when there is a natural disaster because of the transportation climate change, that our transportation insurance also goes up. So our personal uh, funding also goes more to the transportation. So it's a kind of like a cycle to get this, this attention. And this attention has been basically for more than 50 years when the term actually sustainability came. It, it, this attention we have actually received for a long time. And what we have done in the past is basically that due to the globalization that we wanted one, in a one way, it is wonderful that we are very globally connected because of the faster mode of transportation. But often there is a conflict between energy efficiency in transportation and mode of transportation. The faster the mode, the less the trans, uh, energy efficiency. The low, slower the mode, the less, uh, the more energy efficiency. So long time, we have been actually focusing on mostly on the energy efficient vehicle, but that is also controversial as you know that. We do actually make tremendous progress on energy efficiency car. But in the reality that whenever we have energy efficiency car, we actually drive more. And ultimately that VMT, which called vehicle miles travel is going up, not only in the United States, it's worldwide. Scholars are actually studying more than 50 years that how we can make transition to low carbon energy because transportation create tremendous carbon dioxide that is causing the climate change. One of the primary culprit of the climate change and how we can tackle, especially when other sector are making much better progress than the transportation sector. So it's a for a long time debate is going on. One way of dealing, there is a two approach. If you do the literature analysis, you will see that there are two approach. One is sustainable transport technology, which is basically that would be our conversation today. One of them is basically electrification in car. Other, and that including batteries, every technological innovation that is happening and we are talking that may make actually transportation sustainable. On the other hand, that more of a so sustainable travel behavior and built environment that is more focusing on the land use and how we can travel. Because in the reality uh, that recently research actually came out that how you, as I said, that electrification, electricity is a secondary sources of um, uh, energy and how we are producing energy um, uh, electricity is basically depend on whether we can actually making that transition to low carbon uh, emission. 
Uh, in the reality, as we are, as um, you know, currently our technology allow, it shows basically that yes, electric uh, vehicle is not entirely zero uh, emission vehicle. This is what the information we have. If anything is zero emission vehicle, and that would be basically bicycle and um, walk. So long time transportation planner has been actually advocating for a land use, increasing the accessibility so that our everyday activities will be nearby that we don't have to always use utilize the car. And that's the way we can actually reduce the energy use from transportation. So here is one, it's showing that if you build a city that is more of a centralized, compact, energy use is less. You will see all our cities in the United States are in the top, on the top means we are using the most energy. On the other hand, Hong Kong, Tokyo, those are very densely populated cities that um, use the less energy. So, but remember in the United States that early 20th century automobile industry pushed out existing transportation system like streetcar trains. Every technological innovation happened in the world, we pushed out the public transportation, always promoted the car, just like we are promoting the electric vehicle. So car definitely make impossible for the public transportation, having the efficient public transportation in the United States. And I think this part, Greg will talk. Yes, thank you, Dr. Sultana. Um, going off of what Dr. Sultana was just talking about, in the past, we've had various transportation transitions that have occurred. Um, and each time these transitions have occurred, they've always favored personal mobility over public transit. And once again, we're in the middle of one of these big transitions. So right now we have these big tech companies like Google and Tesla um, who are really upending our traditional automobile industry while also keeping some aspects of it the same. Um, so right now what we're seeing is that these large tech giants are aiming at introducing electric vehicles and also autonomous vehicles to the marketplace. These are vehicles that basically drive themselves um, more or less or with very limited human input. We're also seeing that a lot of traditional car manufacturers that we're used to seeing, GM, Ford, um, you know, Mitsubishi, some of these car manufacturers may go out of business or they'll have to shift their business model to compete against the tech industry. So right now our transition is partially transportation, but it's partially also um, a technology-based approach where everything is going to be connected to various platform services, similar to like a Netflix or Hulu. But now you're going to be, you know, going to a charging station and using your subscription at a charging station to charge your vehicle instead. And this whole model may drive uh, traditional gas stations and traditional automobile um, associated industries out of business. And that's just because electric vehicle charging is way different than going to a gas station, refueling your car, um, or you know, getting an oil change at the oil change place. It's something that, that takes place all over at your house um, while you're out shopping. It's not somewhere you just stop once a day to get some fuel. And of course, we have a lot of other disruptions that are going on right now. So we call this the age of technological disruptions. We have ride sharing like Uber and Lyft, which has become very predominant in recent years. And we also have new micro mobilities. I think that everybody is starting to get familiar with all these, you know, scooter sharing companies and bike sharing companies uh, that are distributing their, their, you know, micro mobility for everyday use. So this is what we would call that tech solution that Dr. Sultana was talking about just a moment ago, where we're trying to change the technology, but we're not trying to change too much about the way that we tr uh, treat transit. We still want to have our personal mobility. Um, we still want to be able to drive our vehicle to where we want to drive it. You know, we're not trying to shift completely to a public transit model or change our behavior. But this tech solution is something that a lot of researchers have also argued against. 
Um, and that's because it may not be the most just or equitable um, way of going about a transportation transition. And Dr. Sultan, can you move to the next slide? Thank you. Um, and part of the issue with justice comes from this idea of automation that is going to be um, really hitting the transportation sector and associated industries hard. Um, right now, it looks like potentially over the next 20 to 30 years, somewhere about 25% of um, jobs in the United States may be replaced by automation. There's a high potential for that. And there's also a moderate potential that an additional 35% of jobs may be impacted. And why this is so important from a justice perspective is that it, it tends to be the less educated um, workers overall who suffer from this automation. Especially, we see certain, um, you know, historically disadvantaged communities like, you know, the, the Latinx community um, and, you know, the African American community have a higher risk of job loss due to automation. Um, and communities all across the United States will, will potentially suffer from this automation, this, this new tech transition um, that's going along with the transportation shift. Next slide, please. And another crisis that we're facing, of course, is COVID-19. So COVID-19 has also upended our transportation and it's causing this shift that we're talking about here to kind of rapidly accelerate more quickly than would have been expected previously. So during COVID, a lot of public transit lost some of its ridership. And that's because commuters were you know, traveling into large central business district, downtown areas and cities and then they were able to shift online, especially for those white collar workers. Um, and a lot of them have never gone back to the office. So we see public transit ridership falling, especially in those commercial areas outside of residential areas. Um, and this is, could create a big problem because as transit falls, then our, our leadership may also say that we do not need to invest as much in public transit. Next slide, please, thank you. And here's just some rider day by day ridership numbers um, across um, the Staten Island Railway. And you can see that basically the ridership was decreasing um, after the pandemic started. And it still hasn't fully recovered yet as well. But the weekends tend to see more people using public transit than the weekdays. So that tells you that there may be a shift in who's using public transit. Um, but this is something that we have to look at here. Uh, going forward from a transportation equity perspective, because public transit is also very important for many um, community members who do not have a vehicle. Next slide. And we have to consider that a lot of people are now thinking about buying a car because over the past 30 to 40 years, there was this movement called the back to the city movement where basically a lot of people were moving from the suburbs into the city. But COVID-19 basically ended that movement and now people are moving back out to the suburbs or sometimes even further out because they can telecommute. And so this telecommuting creates a very dispersed urban form. So people wanna live farther out. They do not wanna live in a dense urban community anymore with COVID. And you know just the associated risks that come along with COVID, um, so people are favoring telecommuting. They're favoring living living in you know exurban communities and suburban communities. And now a lot of people who wouldn't traditionally consider buying a car are thinking about buying a car. So all of this ties in with this electric electrification process that Dr. Sultana and I have are talking about, and she's going to continue from here. Meanwhile, you know that. EV performance, basically, EV is very compelling. Years and years after how our public transportation suffer in the United States, especially, I'll focus on that. You can clearly understand that how EV is more compelling because it doesn't require any sacrifice. And there are lot of articles, a lot of research coming out, they are agreeing that yes, EV can contribute 
to the transport sector decarbonization because ultimately it is not possible to building our city in a compact way and all this disruption of transportation is really uncertainty we are living in a uncertainty of time there is studies that are suggesting that for the United States, for American, that it can meet, if we can meet Americans' uh, drivers, because we, we, we love car in the United States. That's the majority population preference is basically the vehicle, personal vehicle. So there is a lot of sell going on, you know, about selling this idea of accelerating the uh, EV cell in the United States, <clears throat> millions of jobs, you know, by then got, uh, administration, administration actually uh, basically uh, set the goal that they will be achieving net zero emission by 2050. Um, so not only that, uh, they are also, sometimes you will hear when this current administration and worldwide actually uh, we basically uh, our governor are actually selling the electric vehicle, selling the you know the ideas of you know, adopting electric vehicle. So there is also another component is also coming. Uh, this as accelerating EV adoption actually can save lives because think about I just said that you know, the transportation not only create the global environmental uh, impact, it also create um, local impact, noise, air pollution. And because due to the, the, the air pollution that there are a lot of health issues in the United States and worldwide. So there are basically, this is from the Goldman Sachs School of Public Policy. They think that, okay, the EV addition can save 1,500, uh, 150 lives, about 1.3 trillion in health and environment damages through 2050. So that's why this is extremely important because we really don't know whether, because whenever they're talking about that will change, we'll have a equity, this is the kind of masses getting, but in the reality, uh, everything actually policy I have looked at, that there is no, um, you know, integration of the um, equity and justice issues for transitioning to the EV. If you know that historically in the United States, that every transportation paradigm, paradigm actually shift, this is a time another paradigm, transportation paradigm shift will happen. It's happening and it is going to happen because I said, because it doesn't require any kind of changes in behavioral changes from us. So majority will support that. But if you recall that historically that par paradigm shift happened and always that there is a polarization happen among different income groups. And often those are low income population. In between global, um, EV addition is increasing. You can see in the United States, the EV adoption is increasing every year, clearly. Not only that, projection of heavy duty electric truck market is also increasing. But there is also some research going on that how we can actually achieve by 2050 the zero emission vehicles. And that statistics actually showing that if we do this slow rating acceleration, then we are not going to achieve the goal by 2050. With the fast acceleration, yes, it is possible to achieve the zero emission vehicle um, 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 goal by 2050. So some of these study actually uh, discuss uh, um, uh, that said acceleration is possible. Where we differ, and I will actually talk a little bit later, that how we accelerate, and that would 
uh, uh, will be my conversation a little bit later. But in between, I like to visit our home, North Carolina. North Carolina is doing the same, just like United States everywhere. That North Carolina also pushed for, you know, uh, Jeb. Um, and there is a goal that 80% of our emotion, uh, you know, vehicle registration goal should be uh, by 2025. By now it is 32 and looks like it is going to make it. Charging station is also increasing. Meanwhile, you also see some study actually done broadly uh, associate that how EV is going to save our um, money we will save our own money and utility customer saving. So ultimately it's a win, win goal. So there is a lot of study going on and this idea is out there and is, 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 is happening. So you can see that it is start with soon and growing rapidly. But if you look at the statistics, who own the EV, you will, at the current state, you will find mostly the high income and predominantly white or some privileged Asian communities mostly actually own um, the EV. I don't have that statistics here. I didn't put it. Okay, but one thing, this report actually brought up that we can only meet that goal if we accelerate the EV penetration. And if we want to do that, that has to be aggressive policy action. At the state, local level, to incentivize individual to purchase PAVE. And this is the time, perfect time, to talk how we are going to make that happen. Meanwhile, Every policy have looked at, there is no such concept of the um, you know, transportation equity and justice, but you, you do hear that word though, it's very overused word. But when a uh, conversation is happening, it's a very marginalized topic. If we will see that if we go to North Carolina electric cooperatives, uh, you know, there are number of group are actually trying to promote EV, to make EV transition happen in the uh, in North Carolina, uh, you will find that there is no justice. You know, there is no talk about equity and justice. But you know, basically, we are selling this is for everyone. I also want you to know the NC is one of the only three states that are not part of the California-led J program, which is basically they want to be um, uh, carbon neutral by 2030 or 35, I believe. And not only that, I think California will stop selling any kind of regular gas, gas car by 2035. So here is the second part of conversation that giving all this feedback, okay? Uh, all this background that Ultimately, actually, there is no uh, concept of transportation equity uh, in, in the conversation. There are basically uh, that, as I said, that acceleration is necessary and that is going to happen, obvious, because this tech industry are behind this and there is a political um, power. They are also in an agreement that we will make the transition to the electrification. But the way welfare economics actually look at the acceler acceleration that typically actually conflict with the equity and justice principle. Equity and justice principle look at that the, 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 um, the benefit should go to the most depriving community. That is, they are suffering 100 years from this car culture that they have a, they suffer from the spatial mismatch, they have suffered from the uh, transportation exclusion, ex transportation exclusivity, job loss, they suffered from and the uh, environmental impact. That's where it should go. But welfare economics actually look at, if fair and equitable market structure are created, which give all market participants incentives to maximize their own individual welfare. 
then the market as a whole will be behaving in a manner which maximize welfare for everyone. So ultimately it's a trickle down approach. That's the way our economy always work. So, but we argue based on transportation and, and, and justice concept that we need to be proactive right now because this community cannot take any more. That is already happening. I did was hard that, okay, we'll make uh, electrification in public transportation. But remember all those topic that how public transportation will be even disrupted. Public transportation, many community is not efficient. There is already disparity. But at the same time, there is a extreme like extreme debate. Welfare economics argue that if we try to address the equity and justice issues at this moment, the way concept actually work, not the welfare system, then it will delay the acceleration of the electrification in the transportation. And that's where uh, the debate is. But California, I will give you example that California is actually integrated, that only one state in, 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 in the United States actually integrated in an equity toolkit. And I really applaud that. Oh, North Carolina doesn't have that. So this is kind of there. They have, you know, federal government gives $7,500 um, for the electric vehicle. On the other hand, also local government, like, you know, California also offer a lot of incentive. And in that incentive, actually, they do have a website. You can go to their website. They also look at created environment, which is basically um, based on the environmental justice um, uh, framework, philosophy, that historically pollution burden, exposure, environmental effects uh, is mostly go to the historically low income population. So identifying those neighborhood. So if you are living in that neighborhood, you will most likely get under this policy that you will get the rebates because they in California also provide a rebates and there is an income group if you look at the income group this income group is this so you can see it's pretty high income group but at the same time they are actually looking into the environmental justice issue so if they look at if anybody's applying and it can identify that this is the neighbor, neighborhood, this, that, that um, incentive goes disproportionately a uh, different way. Okay, so it is, but what is the problem with the California? Okay, California's problem with this, I will show you in a little while. If you look at that market share, recently one of the research actually came out, uh, and including that is in California, that people are willing to buy hybrid because it's, it's more expensive. Electric vehicle is more expensive, but hybrid is more or uh, less expensive and people are willing to buy that. But the JEP program does not, even though you know hybrid actually reduces tremendous amount of greenhouse gas em emission, but JEP program does not incentivize uh, the, um, 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 you know, um, uh, any, any kind of uh, financial, financial benefit, okay? Uh, so, uh, so these are, if you look at the willing to pay for hybrid and plug-in, you see that is mostly there is, you will find the positive that including actually California, but not any other state is even uh, negative actually. That is other JP state, you can see plug-ins, hybrid is negative. So mostly people are actually willing to pay for hybrids because that's what they can afford at this moment. They cannot afford more than that at this moment. So you can, we are, uh, we want you to know. But as you know, that California created that equity toolkit where people can actually apply, apply for fun, um, for the rebet. But if you look at it, the recent research actually found out that they found that, uh, you know, 
current rebate predominantly going to high income electric vehicle buyers in California, despite their equity program. So you can remember that this 7,500 7, that you are receiving from federal government, a huge subsidy, it is all going to the high income population. It will stop at one point when if we actually follow the social welfare model of equity, economics the way I believe, then we will, this benefit is not going to the poor population. It's only serving the rich population. Okay, and I'm gonna continue from here. Um, so another thing that comes along with EV adoption is also the need for charging stations. So right now, Europe leads the world when it comes to EV sales as a proportion of the total vehicle sales by country. So you see, for instance, Norway has about half of their, their new vehicle sales are EVs. Um, other, you know, kind of forward thinking European countries like Sweden and Netherlands uh, also have a decent share of their new vehicles being EVs. But throughout the entire world, um, most economies have yet to really deeply consider um, what level of EVs that they want to, to you know, sell. But those mandates that Dr. Sultana was talking about are really going to start to push this along with that kind of tech-based transition that we were looking at a moment ago. And also, the number of charging stations continues to grow as well. And it, it naturally is greater in places like China and the United States, since these are very large countries in terms of area. Um, but we still need way more charging stations to meet demand. Next slide, please. Thank you. So over these next few slides, I'm going to kind of give us a, a smaller scale look at the charging aspect of equity and justice. So this study here looks at the city of Chicago, and you can see that there's two maps here. There's one on the left and one on the right. The one on the left shows the estimated number of registered EVs um, in each community area of Chicago. And if you don't know much about Chicago, basically the northern half of the city is traditionally more economically well off, tends to be a little more um, affluent than the southern and western parts of the city. And you can see from this, this, when you follow this kind of welfare economic model, where you're trying to maximize the benefits for the whole of society, but you're not necessarily trying to um, maximize benefits for smaller communities of people, that you end up with a very inequitable distribution of charging resources. And that's what that purple map there on the right shows. So often we hear food deserts. Well, there are also charging deserts. And basically, the entire southern half of the city of Chicago and also some portions of the western part of Chicago have these really large and expansive charging deserts. And this is something we see across many different geographies. Next slide, please. And we also see it in North Carolina. So right now in North Carolina, we have increasing amounts of electric vehicles being um, registered here in our state and, and people purchasing electric vehicles. And the amount of energy consumption that these electric vehicles um, need is also increasing over time. So if we do not also consider, of course, some clean energy solutions for EVs, then we won't really see a full decrease in those greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then also we see that um, the total amount of charging stations continues to rise, but our demand is starting to outpace that rise. So we're not having quite enough charging stations to meet the, the overall demand. And that's what that bottom chart there shows. Now, looking at this from a social vulnerability perspective, this map here in the upper left shows the parts of our state that have the highest social vulnerability index score. And basically, the social vulnerability index looks at a number of factors such as income, race, um, you know, historical health disadvantages, environmental conditions, and it assigns a different um, ranking to, to different counties or geographies in our state. And where you see a one, those are places that are very vulnerable. So they have very high social vulnerability. And places where you see you know, two or less, that very light shade of pink, 
those are areas that have very low social vulnerability. And the interesting thing that we see here is that charging stations are naturally being put in those areas that have the low social vulnerability. So places like the Research Triangle and Charlotte, um, whereas the rural communities, you know, out in the far west of our state or out along the coastal plain, um, especially areas that have large Native American populations, yep, like that area up there, or um, also along kind of our southern border with South Carolina, where, you know, the Lumbee historically live, uh, we see that there's very low amounts of charging there. Um, and um, to, to some small extent, it makes sense because these areas are more rural. But at the same time, this also shows us that welfare economics model, where we're trying to maximize the number of stations in these large cities, and we, we're kind of just waiting for later on to, to put charging stations in these other communities. And that is not always the most equitable or just way to go about a transition. Sometimes you need to include that infrastructure earlier on um, so that those communities can begin to plan their transition. Without that, they may get caught or left behind um, as the transition continues to move forward. And then one more look here at our own Guilford County. So for local people, you can see that there's a big difference between the city of High Point and the city of Greensboro when it comes to charging. And historically, High Point, um, when we look at Greensboro and High Point as a whole, we look at them as an entire body uh, High Point is traditionally more vulnerable than Green Point uh, than Greensboro. Um, so Greensboro traditionally has had more affluence than High Point, and you can see that reflected in the charging accessibility here in these maps. So the charging accessibility um, is much higher, especially in that western part of Greensboro, and it's much lower in the rural areas, um, and especially High Point. Um, so High Point's very surprising because it has the same population density as Greensboro, but yet it's very low. The amount of charging in High Point is comparable to some of these rural areas in the outlying part of our county. So we see this equity divide in charging, and it's across multiple geographies, multiple scales, multiple cities. And that's why we have to think about this issue um, from different perspectives, and we need to consider um, the future of charging and electrification in those communities. Well, so as Greg said, that we have looked at, at you know, even though California has a very strong, I would say only it's a role, it's a model actually. Um, and California um, is still, you can see that, you know, as a most of those voucher way into the um, comparatively wealthy population. So as you see that, and uh, Greg said, that this basically social welfare economic theory is the way we are actually moving forward. Already that is what it is showing based on our analysis. We have done many analysis that is not actually in this slide. What is the problem with social welfare um, equity? Social welfare equity is problem, if you recall that actually automobile came to the uh, world, especially in the United States and sometimes in very early 20th century. And it didn't, it didn't become affordable until 1960s. So 60 year, we will be waiting to make the transition, these people who actually suffered the most, when there would be huge disruption in public transportation because of the automation of jobs and how that would change the concentration and employment, we don't know. It's already it is showing because of the COVID, a lot of office space are going away. So there are a lot of disruption going on. And during this uncertainty, that state-centric policy is not reliable, which is basically social welfare policy we always follow. And those follows, it's not always, those are mostly analysts, okay? 
politician, as you know, EV politicians are very onto that because this tech giant want to make that profit. Users, of course, people who wants to buy the EV, uh, they have an organization and how to penetrate the EV market, okay? Scientists, definitely. And other stakeholders are not always, you know, purposively rational. This sort of policy gives notion to BIPOC communities regarding the EV, EV are luxurious goods. They are, you know, it's like, they don't even think about, oh, they cannot even imagine. So giving that notion is problematic. So what we need that basically the social welfare equity is not, no longer if we want to save this earth, climate change, as well as that this community is suffering for, from the automobile more than 100 years. I, I cannot tell all those stories, then that will be another lecture. So those communities already suffering, they have a lack of public transportation, good public transportation already. And now we are pouring money into the CV without the concentration, consideration of these people. So we need actually societal centric policy, utilizing environmental justice framework, where equity and justice must be central to the EV subsidies and infrastructure planning. Income-based incentives. So we don't need, I mean, we propose that we don't need to provide because those wealthy people will buy EV anyway. There is no need to provide because it's a toy, just like iPhone. They will buy it. Those, if we don't give, it will go to, it's possible, to go to low income population. And also education and marketing, that how EV can be good, good for the health, good for the environment, because those people don't think that they can afford it. Well, but how can we do that? How can we do that utilizing environmental justice framework? And that definitely, if we want to provide those funding that we have to have identify communities, just like what basically California is doing, uh, that uh, in, in a very similar way, uh, but there has to be, every community needs to be involved, like especially bringing BIPOC bi 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 communities into the dialogue for this transition. I know that kind of dialogue is actually going on for, you know, for energy transition, but EV, I don't see that, okay? So this kind of conversation needs to happen. So also it have to happen that, you know, data collection and analyze and modeling. Of course, agency leads analysis, we need that. Also community lead analysis, both necessary. And then ultimately community organization mobilization and demanding for participatory budgeting. So this is a kind of process and participatory budgeting, incorporating participatory visioning for building disruptive future scenarios of public transit. These folks need to know that how they, because it shows that during the COVID, these people were using um, uh, Uber. And still that during the COVID, it also shows that how public transportation is vital to our life. Because a lot of those transportation being used for the frontline worker. They've transported from one place to another. So it's extremely important. So preferences of so building this community, bringing together that and visioning that what should our future transportation look like? Is disruption is coming. They need to be part of this conversation. And to find out preferences determine the most viable policy intervention for their communities. Not um, we're suggesting that will happen in everywhere. Where is the most viable? It can be electric car sharing in areas with limited transit service. Because I know I as a whole um, came in this country as a migrant. 
and I use public transit for transportation, uh, even in a, one of the biggest, largest cities in, in America, and how, um, you know, it's disturbing uh, to know that how a disadvantage it can create when there is not a, not, there is not a strong and efficient public transportation is there. Because if you work at midnight, it's hard to get public transportation. So it's a bringing this community and, and making them uh, participate. And based on the, and in summary, I would say, and then based on this, this transition has to happen based on the environmental justice uh, equity framework. On that note, thank you. I acknowledge UNCG Greensboro first faculty grant for providing us funding to do some of the research that we have done, preliminary analysis that we have uh, shown. Um, UNCG Greensboro Office of Sustainability for inviting us to give this talk. I hope that we can get more invitation uh, to give this talk to the community. That's our plan. Um, and of course, uh, I couldn't do this research without my research team at uh, Geography, Environment and Sustainability. And thank you. On that note, if you have any question, um, I would um, entertain um, your uh, you know, question. Thank you, thank Salima you. and Greg. We really appreciate it. Um, Salima, can you uh, unshare your slides and we'll uh, all unmute everybody. Um, give me just a second here to... Okay, you should be able to unmute yourselves. And if you can use the um, raise hand, uh, you know, aspect of the Zoom to, we'll call on you that way. Don't be shy. There was a lot of, a lot going on in the, yeah. in the chat. Do you want which, me to go uh, to Greg, you? Greg ad addressed some of that are already. Um, are there, Sarah, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. So um, really interesting talk. Uh, so it looks like, you know, a lot of your research focuses on public charging station is, and, um, you know, a lot of EV owners primarily charge at home. And since lower income people are more likely to live in apartments and not have a place to charge at home, do you see that as an additional barrier besides cost in terms of adopting EVs? Um, yes, we are actually that you will see some of that we didn't discuss that here. Yes, and that's why I think that some of the policies is coming from the admin, uh, by the administration. I, he actually allocated um, that his administration actually had allocated billions of dollars for EV infrastructure, and uh, there are um, uh, many, uh, you know, state is considering that putting because this is research has been talking that how that is disadvantage and make sure that every apartment complex has. Uh, charging station. I was reading the other day. Um, Greg, do you want to add a little bit more? Yeah, uh, definitely residential charging is very vital to all of this. And also understanding the travel behavior of people who live in multifamily complexes is also very vital. Um, because if there isn't any residential charging, then the public charging has to be placed in, you know, within the needs of people who live in that community. Um, so we have to also look at the travel behavior aspect. And I also uh, believe that, you know, a lot of, um, um, uh, actually, when one of the research we found that a lot of charging station is in a very high densely populated area. And we haven't finished the looking in you know, everything, but I believe those are the area, it's a downtown area where a high ending apartment complex. No, that is, like yeah, that is going to happen obviously, uh, but whether it is low income neighborhood, uh, that's the question, yeah. Uh, in the chat, one of the mm -hmm. questions was, um, will the spread of electric vehicle use um, cause more sprawl and poor land use? Uh, well, this is basically, it has been showing 
and that um, so far it is showing that many people, as you, you notice that EV charging station is barely in the rural areas. Uh, unless you are uh, you are in the kind of national parks area, okay? Because people go travel there. So there are a lot of EV uh, charging station. But on, this is what we are also talking about, that rural population, that yes, there is considerable interest among the rural population to use EV because it's ultimately the cost of uh, personal, um, you know, vehicle ownership is going to go down. So yes, to answer your question, since this is this basically, I think we suspect that will create more sprawl. Mm -hmm. And we actually said that in our presentation, this most likely density is going to decline over the year. Thank you, David. So at the beginning of your presentation, you're talking quite a bit about CO2 emissions and mm -hmm climate change, if most of the electricity being produced for EV cars is coming mm -hmm. from highly polluting plants, such as coal-fired plants mm -hmm. and natural gas plants, isn't the spread of EV vehicles only going to increase that pollution? Because it's, it's you know, it's the efficiency of converting coal to electricity and then using electricity in a vehicle versus the efficiency of burning gasoline directly in an engine would be my first question, which is more efficient and which is less polluting overall. But also secondly, EV cars use lithium batteries, a lot of other um, rather toxic metals and strategic metals. Um, which we get from Canada and unfortunately from Russia and from the third world. And so I'm wondering if the pollution from those uses of metals and other elements for the EV cars is gonna cause additional types of pollution that will also be very difficult to clean up if ever. David, um, you actually asked a very good question. Okay, that's... Uh... Yes, when we're talking about if, um, you know, uh, there are very, um, one of the books, Shavakal is a very famous or transitioning to low carbon. Um, he talked about all the alternative, trans alternative energy sources and their, um, uh, you know, trouble with it. So there is no, exactly at this moment, there is no entire clean energy. But at the same time, there is a lot of promise going on about the battery, the battery price as you know, that also <clears throat> fuel cell forklift, uh, that where we can have a, uh, you know, portable uh, gas with us. Um, and we can carry it and it, within a minute we can change uh, the, um, you know, that portable tank and it, our car will generate its own um, energy. So those kind of conversation is going on. So this is a two, we really don't know. It's a, that's what thing that maybe 50 years later we may actually do. I kind of agree with you because battery, those will be uh, has to be deposited somewhere. Um, Can I add to this a little bit yes, too? Yes, definitely. Yeah, um, and I think that that David, you pointed this out earlier <laughs> when mm -hmm. you pointed out, should we be building those those power plants then in the higher income, you know, more advantaged community? Um, so it's kind of like there is a shifting of burdens when you are having more coal fire, you know, um, fuel production at these these power plants, it's going to increase potentially pollution in those suburban communities, those exurban communities, or those communities kind of on the urban fringe, um, which is why you have to have a clean energy transition that goes along exactly. with the EV. You know, you need to have, um, nothing is completely clean, as you know, solar panels have those same toxin issues as the batteries. Um, you know, uh, hydroelectric has its own issues with the environment, but you have to bring cleaner fuel sources 
or else you're just shifting the burden onto other people. Same thing with the lithium batteries. We're just shifting some of that burden into, you know, developing countries, into parts of Africa, into parts of South America. And so there's such a, this is such an interesting and complex subject matter that, that there's so many different avenues to potentially look at this. Um, but on a grand scale, it hopefully, you know, electrification, as long as it's coupled with these other things, will reduce some of these environmental harms. And uh, there is a tremendous, this is if you read that the technological, especially battery, is the battery technology is improving tremendously. And that's probably that whole. But yes, again, the question is how those will be actually recycled. So even a combine with the recycle and everything, other, you know, other kind of infrastructure is built with that, that it will be recycled properly. Um, uh, uh, definitely, I think, you know, uh, we may, scenario would be uh, different. And if it is not done uh, that properly, um, yes, uh, your question is very valid. 50 years later, we may actually look back, you know, like, you know, when we created a high, uh, highway and um, we, we were thinking that we'll be connected fast, but a highway has a tremendous impact in the community's economy and environment that we didn't think about that at that time. Yes. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question if anybody wants to ask anything. Don't be shy. You can all, if you're, you know, if you, if you are shy, you can send me a, a, a chat privately, question privately in the chat too, if you want, but. So yeah, anyway, I, think, I, I just want yeah. to tell you, David, that um, the battery is where the largest batteries producer is China, giant. But anyway, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, well, I was just gonna, uh, I'll give every, I'll say a couple things and mm -hmm. give everybody a chance to maybe think of a mm -hmm. question. But yeah, I think a, a lot of this is, you used California as an example. And, mm -hmm. and we see in California, they're making a lot of changes to uh, regulations within the state, particularly when it comes to expanding solar or keeping natural gas out of mm -hmm. homes and res residential homes. And I think we're really gonna have to start if we want to address um, the inequities that are happening within rural communities, because I said, you know, mm -hmm. these grant applications that are coming from settlement money or from, you know, the Department of Transportation or mm -hmm. Housing and Urban Development at the federal level require grant applications, you know, and a lot of um, low-income mm -hmm. communities don't have the, the capacity to, to write and report on, on those things and, and to navigate that federal process. It, it's complicated mm -hmm. enough for me, you know? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we're really going to have to start seeing regulations built into like whenever there's low density, or I mean, high density, multi-use, um, you know, residential mixed with commercial development that we're going to have to say, okay, if you're going to build this, you're going to have to put in electrical charging station infrastructure in here. And I think that's, you know, embedding these types of things into the law is going to be a, an integral part to, you know, increasing um, the widespread use of, of these, particularly outside of urban communities. Because otherwise, if you're just, you know, writing, you know, it's a first come first serve, like who has the capacity to do this? It's just not gonna happen. Um, okay, David, I think we'll do one last last question and then um, we'll, we'll close it for the day. So this is just a quick question. Um, the EV cars uh, and trucks, I suppose, for that matter, do they use a different plug than, you know, the usual 120 volts plug? And is there a move towards moving cars to standard plugs? I can answer that one. Yeah. Um, yes, there's actually three charging standards in the United States for EVs. Um, so there's the J1772 charging standard, which is um, your tr tr traditional AC charging port, what you just mentioned a moment ago. Um, but then we also have two other charging standards. That's the SAE standard, which is a much faster and higher voltage charging um, capacity that we're seeing in newer EVs. And then Tesla has its own version of a very fast charger that only works on Teslas. So 
we have three different standards, but all the vehicle manufacturers in the U.S., except for Mitsubishi, I, Mitsubishi just wants to be its own thing, I guess, um, have agreed to have a universal standard coming up. So uh, we don't know what that will look like quite yet. It's probably going to be that SAE um, faster charging capability standard, but I'm not 100% sure how each company is going to implement that yet, but that's actually a very good point because there's vast differences in also the energy burden that comes from charging with different charging outlet types and also the types of charging you can do. How fast does it take? Is it something that you have to wait five hours to charge your vehicle fully or is it done in 20 minutes? So that's a really interesting concept. Um, the reason I was asking is because you're talking about public infrastructure rather than mm -hmm. private. And so people in their garages presumably can have converters um, plugged into their either their 220 or 110 plugs. But um, if you're doing outside charging stations, you have those very, fairly expensive ones mm -hmm. and very few of them. Or you have, you know, maybe eventually where people are parking their cars on the streets, um, you would have plugins next to the um, parking signs or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some places in Europe already plug do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I could see a day when they actually do switch to some regular standard, the same as your household appliances. Yes, that is, I could completely see that as well. And you're right that most residential charging is very slow charging. Um, it's okay. not like super high voltage, um, like some of these public chargers are. And thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, David. Also, that I would also um, say that you know, for the uh, if you want to have a adapter in in your house for EV adapter for charging adapter, there is actually incentive as well. So you can get. Um, um, Tax breaks. Uh, yeah. Tax breaks. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks you, Sarah. Thank you, Salima and Greg. We really appreciate you um, joining us today. We learned a lot. Um, I hope everybody has a great Monday and a great rest of the week. And um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>